So to this point, we've been building all the fundamental components required to get the CPU assembled. So let's start out with inputs and outputs. So that basically defines the ins and outs of our of our CPU. Now we need uh, we need components. Obviously, we need the ALU. We need some registers. Let's. So we know we need some. Uh, we know we need registers. So let's load up the register library. And okay, that came in. That's good. Uh, we know we need the ALU. And again, if, you, if you're stumbling on this video and you're like, well, where are all these things? We, these were built in uh, prior videos in this series. Yeah, and the ALU came in. That's nice. Great, it came in as well, nice. So yeah, I think we have all the components that we need now. Okay, so let's put them out there. So we need an A register. A. And we need a D register. And now I'll just kind of put them around because I'm going to have to rearrange them. And then we need a ALU. And then we need a program counter. You know, when it gets right down to it, the CPU, it's just not a lot to it. PC has one component in the circuit that has the same label as the component name of a newly placed component, this label has been removed. Okay, well, I guess the labeling, I don't really care about. Hopefully that doesn't matter. Let's start by defining the input to the A register. There's two sources for the A register. One is from an instruction defined as an A instruction, or if C, if a C instruction, uh, then we want to potentially load a with the result of a C instruction if the C instruction is encoded in a certain way that you know within within the instruction there's destination uh, flags that can indicate that the destination of the value of the ALU should go into the A register. So that sounds to me like a mux. It's two two different sources, and so this mux is going to be passing sixteen data bits. Oops, 16 data bits. And it's got one select bit because there's, there's two choices. Uh, so instruction, if it's an A instruction, and the result of output that comes from the ALU, we don't have the ALU in there, but this is the, this is the result of the output from the ALU. So we'll simply route this signal over as input to the controlling mux that's going to then load into the input for the register. Okay, so that's the easy part. The harder part is the control logic for determining which one of these gets selected. To control 
the whether or not the input is either the instruction or a result of the ALU, that's simply controlled by the definition on the instruction in the 15th bit. Uh, specifically, that's the I bit. And so if the I bit is uh, true, I think I have this backwards. That's what I'm looking at. Yeah, I do have it backwards. So if the 15th bit of the instruction is zero, that means that's an A, that's an A instruction. And if it's a one, it's a C instruction. Already got lines crossing. Oh, well, it's unfortunate. Um, okay, so it's the 15th bit. So we need a splitter to peel off that bit. I hate it has a hot auto connects in this case. That's not handy. Okay, so in this case, something like this should work but it's kind of ugly. Right, so that actually takes care of the wiring of that one. Now, this is ugly. I'm gonna clean it up. I cleaned up the A register MUX control by going ahead and encapsulating the simple selector here. So that it just sort of clears up the main design, even though there's really not much going on here. But I think I'm going to, for the remainder of this, just kind of continue to follow that. That way, this diagram will be kept clean. Let's implement the control circuit for the A register load control, which would be this signal right here. So let's create a A reg load CTL. The input is 16-bit instruction. And the output is simply a 1-bit output signal because it just feeds the load signal on the register. The, so the determination of whether the A register should be loaded or not is dependent upon whether the instruction that is coming in is either an, is, is an A instruction. And that is the case if the highest order bit is a zero. So we need a splitter. And let's pull this down. So on the 15th bit, we need an inverter. Gates, here we go. All right, gate. Okay, so we load when this is true, or we also load when, this, when a C instruction uh, occurs, which means the 16th bit is one, and the D1 bit is true. So uh, we need to have an AND gate because we need to AND whether or not the I bit is high and the D1 bit is high. Because the D1 bit is, is the fifth bit. So bit five. And then the uninverted bit 15. So if both of those are true, then we load. So either we load here or we load here. So that sounds like an OR gate. And then that goes to our output. And why is that red? Did I, oh, that needs to be an out. Oh, 
There we go. So let's go back to the CPU. And let's add in. Here, and I'm going to try to flip these to classic, hopefully, given that they're not loaded in as a mod, as a um, library, it won't cause any problems. We'll see, though. Just keeps it a lot neater without having to have these big representations here. So there it is our load control for the A register. Let's put up one of the input to the ALUs. Let's create a subcircuit. ALU AM MUX CTL. So we have, uh, again, an instruction. We're going to be selecting bits off of the instruction. And we need a splitter again. And here's our output. The logic is it is uh, I and not A. And uh, so I is the, again the 15th bit. And since we're doing an AND, we need an AND gate. And since it's not A, we need a NOT gate. Again, that was on bit 12. And then there's our output. And that's all there is to that. And then, of course, we need a MUX to MUX in either uh, the input from M or the output, I say input, uh, this is basically from memory, either this value or the output from the A register. So let's find a MUX. And so when the select logic is true, we want the value from M. So uh, let's see, move this up here. And if we're, if the uh, select is false, that means we want the value from A. And of course, this needs 16 bits. And this also needs 16 bits. We need our control signal here. So let's put in our freshly minted control logic. And we'll make it small. And I think I'm going to flag the instruction. I'm going to do uh, something like this, I think. Well, we'll leave leave those connected, but we will also flag it off or tunnel it off. Um, maybe we'll flip this around. That makes this easier. So let me pull this in. Let 
So I'm pretty sure that's what the tunnel's for. These things, the labels match up, and so it connects them together as a bus. I hope that's what how that works. And then the output. goes to that MUX selector. And then the output of the MUX goes to one of the inputs of the ALU. We'll just make it X. Doesn't really matter. At least I don't think it does. Let's fire up the deregister. The input of the deregister comes from the output of the ALU. So let's create another tunnel, they call it. Uh, so we'll call this, uh, I guess we can call this out in as well. Again, it's 16 bits. Great. So now we want an uh, out M going into the input signal of the D register. Well, the output of D register is easy. It just goes in as another input to the ALU. So we can wire that up straight, pretty straightforward, just like this. And there's the Y input. And again, these might be backwards. We'll figure it out in a minute. Okay. So let's do the control circuitry for the load for the D register. So again, we will create a new circuit. We'll call this um, D. Reg load CTL. Again, we need instruction in 16 bits, and we need uh, output. And we need uh, a splitter because, again, it's being split out from the instruction. Okay, and so the way the D register load control works is we need to have C instruction. So that means the I bit, which is the 15th bit, needs to be high. And we want to load D. And so the destination flag uh, called D2 is just the flag that does that. It indicates if it's high that we want D to be loaded with the result from the from the ALU. And the D bit is, and I'm looking it up, five. It's the fifth bit. So we need a AND gate. And so the I bit is the is uh, bit 15. And D2 is the fifth bit. It'd be cool uh, maybe to put some documentation in here. I probably will go do that as well. Back to the CPU. So we can put in our load circuit here. And let's make it small. Okay, so again, input from the instruction. So a little tunnel symbol. Sixteen. Flip it around. So in the same vein of what we just did with the deregister and its load control, the load circuitry for memory or writing a value out to memory, this flag right here, is pretty similar to this. So let's go ahead and do the. I'm going to call it control circuitry, but basically it's the circuitry that figures out what the status of this is supposed to be. Let's go ahead and do a sub-circuit for that. So write M CTL. And again, sim uh, similar refrain. Okay, so so I mentioned it was similar to the deregister. 
uh, in that we have to have a C instruction, which means I needs to be high. So that's bid 15. And then we want to load or write to M. Well, that's uh, another bit on the instruction. And that happens to be the destination bit three, D3. And D3 is the, is the third, is bit number three. I think I may have gotten D2 wrong. I got to go back and look at it because the zero base stuff, I probably screwed that up. So again, that's an and. Bit zero, bit one, bit two, bit zero, one, two, three. It's kind of confusing the way the numbering is. Uh, and then when bit 15 is high as well, or, or they both have to be high, that's then because we have, have a C instruction and the destination is memory. then this will become our right flag. And that's all there's to that. Let me go back and look at deregister load control. I think I probably screwed that up. So this was supposed to be D2, and this would be really nice if I had actually put the uh, put a little documentation in here. Yeah, this should be bit four. Bit zero, one, two, three, four. I may have to go back and look at the other ones to make sure I didn't screw those up too. So while we're at it, let's put some text in here. So this is I and D2. And this is uh, I and D3. Should be I and not a so a register load control should be uh not i or i and d1 probably got this one wrong too okay d1 the D1 bit, it's bit five, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, sure did. Got that one wrong too. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Good thing I'm double checking. I would have gone crazy trying to test this and <laughs> everything would have worked wrong. Okay, now that I fixed all those, let's get back to the right end control. So this one, simply the output of our control and then the input now we'll stick it stick it here maybe and then the input again is the instruction All right, that takes care of that. Output of the A register goes several places. So uh, it's easy to wire that up. So what we need, what I'm going to do to keep this simple is uh, I'm going to put a uh, tunnel on that as well. I'm going to call it out A. Try to squeeze it in here. Maybe I'll move this over a little bit. Okay. Okay. Well, where does where does A go? Well, one place A goes is in, is it it goes as input to the program counter. So that's easy. The other place that it goes is here, right? We can address memory, kind of what the A register is for. It's all about addressing. So um, let's go ahead and add a tunnel input to here.
And let's do some other easy signaling. So again, on the program counter, when this is reset, program counter goes to zero. And that's all this reset is meant to do, is it just resets the program counter to zero. So that's easy. When this is high, this just passes through to reset. Some more easy signaling to pick up. Just wire all the clocks. Uh, basically, just these three components are clocked. The ALU is not clocked. Uh, wiring up the ALU is actually pretty straightforward, even though there's more signals. Uh, first thing first, though, of course, uh, I was looking at the X and the Y inputs, and of course, I have them backwards. Uh, the D input is supposed to come from, or is supposed to go to the X input of the ALU. And I do think it matters because um, I think some of the instructions would wind up being backwards because one subtracts from the other. So um, definitely, I think we will, we need to hook these up the correct way. So unfortunately, they're going to cross over. Gross, but it works. OK, so that's that's fixed. The input signals on this side are basically just decoded from bits off of the instruction. It's basically just a fan out. So what I'm going to do is put a tunnel So we need a splitter and this needs to fan out 16 and I still didn't get enough room. Okay. Didn't connect to anything. That's good. So the gist of it is, is that the bits, the C bits on the instruction correspond directly one for one to the input bits on the ALU. And it is through the combination of these bits that you get all of your operations. The, the first bit, well, let's look for the ZX. So the ZX bit corresponds to C1, which is bit 11. Yeah, bit 11. So 15, 14, 12, 11. So that's bit 11. And I can tell already I'm probably not going to have enough room to fan these out. OK, we'll see. OK, so the next instruction, what do we got? NX. So NX is C2, and C2 is bit 10. Cool. Next uh, instruction, let's do a ZY because ZY is C3 and C3 corresponds to bit nine. Next bit we'll do is uh, NY. NY corresponds to bit C4 and C4 bit eight on the fan out. So The next one is the F, F flag. F flag is C5 and C5 is bit seven. Okay, this is taking shape here. The NO bit, not output I think is what that stands for, is bit six, corresponds to C6. Okay, we're going to leave zero, the uh, zero and negative bits alone for a second because they really deal with comparisons on determining when to jump. And that is control. Those are control signals to help figure out when to load the program counter.
Yeah, but let's turn to the program counter. Uh, one easy connection for the program counter. Just, uh, we'll just do this. I saved the best for last or next to last because the uh, increment flag is the one that'll be last, but next to last is load of the program counter. So the way this ultimately works, and it's the most complicated logic that you have to figure out in the whole book, um, is that on the C instruction, the C instruction tells you what kind of jump you want to do, conditional jump, and the and and those are uh, those are the J bits on the C instruction. Those are documented on page sixty nine of the book. Uh, so you need you need those three J bits, J one, two, and three. Tells you whether you're doing a less than, equal to, or greater than conditional jump. And then you need the two bits off the ALU, the zero bit and the uh, negative bit. So these two flags plus the three J bits, bits one, two, and three on the instruction uh, will give you the information that you need to decode whether or not you want to load the program counter or not. Because basically, uh, if, this, if the uh, condition, if the comparison condition that you're looking for is met, then you want to load the program counter with the des the new destination address, which is going to be, of course, in the uh, A register. So let's hook up a circuit or create a circuit that implements that logic. PC load CTL. So as I mentioned, there's three input bits. And then there are two um, bits from the ALU. And then we have the out, which is just another bit it's indicating whether we're essentially going to load the program counter or not. Now, because these bits, I kind of wanted to do it this way because I wanted to see these bits broken out with their labels because it's, uh, I don't know, it's better to correspond with the what the book is doing, but uh, I think I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it this another way instead. What I'm going to do is just pass in the instruction because they come off the instruction and we also need the I bit because this activity is only supposed to occur whenever we have a C instruction in the first place. So it's not supposed to happen with an A instruction. Yeah, so what we'll do is we'll create a pin. Well, you know, one thing that I know has to be done is we need the inverse. We need the inverse of all of these uh, flags. And it'll become evident here in a minute why we do. I think I'm going to want tunnels on these two guys as well. So let's do this. Cool. All right, that's gonna keep it in much more organized. Let's see here. So let's just first do jump of greater than. And so that's gonna be implemented with an AND gate, a multi-input AND gate. And 
That conditional is indicated when J1 and J2 are 0 and J3 is a 1. We need five inputs, and it'll become obvious in a minute. And only one data bit on each one of the inputs. And we'll call this one um, JGT. And then, oh, looky, I just realized there's negations here. I didn't need to negate these. That's okay. Um, because I think, yeah, you, I could have put the label and then negated it and then it would have been, not, eh, okay, that's okay. Nice to know. I did not know that Logisim uh, had the ability to negate the inputs. So first of all, let's do the J bits. So again, uh, bits J1 and 2 have to be zero. And then J3 has to be true. Uh, this is jump if greater than. So the output bits from the ALU both have to be not negative and not zero in order to implement jump if greater than. Make sense? It does to me. Okay, so both of these need to be not, not zero, not negative. Okay, and there is our jump if greater than. Let's do jump if equal. Now, I think this format is going to work out fine, so maybe I'm just going to co copy and paste to uh, move things along quickly. Let's see, it'll let me paste. Oh, I did. Okay, so this is going to be uh, J uh, jump of equal, so let's label it. Is indicated by J2 being true and J1 and J3 being false. J3 being false. Uh, so this is jump, jump if equal. And so our zero bit would need to be zero. Let's do jump if greater than or equal to. Let's do this one since we only need four. Right, so how does this one go? This one's a little a little different. Oh, um, let me let's label this. Oh, interestingly, it gave us another another input here. Let's uh, let's. Yeah, I don't like that. It seems like it's going to cause problems. Oh yeah. See how it's split. Oh, this one's not connected. That's what happened. And that's okay. I'm glad I did that. So actually it didn't keep it. That's the other input, but it disconnected this line, even though it doesn't look like it's disconnected. I guess I would call that a bug. It certainly would make things confusing, and it even shows that it's green, which you would think it should show blue, because blue means not connected, I think. Yeah, see, blue's not connected. No, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm glad I did mess with that. Okay, so this one should be uh, jump if greater than or equal to, so JGE. Nice. Okay. So JGE, the J bits to indicate that code should be 
not J1, got that one, J2, and J3. So J2 and J3. Okay, so that in, those J bits indicate we want to do a jump of greater than or equal to. Now, we have two bits. We have a zero bit and we have a negative bit. Wow. Zero and negative. So jump of greater than, greater than or equal to would mean either we're equal to, meaning the zero bit set, or we're not negative. So that means we need an OR gate. And we need our zero flag, or zero, keep calling it flag, I mean tunnel, zero tunnel. So this satisf satisfies the equal part. And then we need the not negative. I don't know. Are all these tunnels helping? I think it is. I think it keeps it neater. If these all had to like go crisscross everywhere, it'd be really hard to figure out. But you can tell me in, in the comments if you like how this is done or not. All right, next one. Jump if less than. And I guess I'll do this one here and maybe we'll stagger. Yeah, oh, we'll do it down here. So we got room. So this one needs to be JLT, jump if less than. Yep, that's correct. Okay, so jump if less than is J1. Not J2, which we have, and then not J3. not J3. We want to jump if we're less than. So that means can't be zero and it has to be negative. So not zero and then negative. Okay, next one. Let's do jump if not equal. Let me label this one. So jump if not equal is J1. Not J2. And J3. If, so, so this is jump if not equal, so our zero bit just has to be false, so not zero. Slowly but surely, five down. Next one, uh, jump if less than or equal to. So I'm smelling another or conditional. So let's take this one. We do need a little wire routing room. I may move these over. Okay, I, I think that gives us enough room. Okay, so this one here is a uh, jump if less than or equal to. And um, its J bits are, so J1 is true. So J1, J2, not J3.
All right, so we got our j bits. So now, so this is jump if less than or equal to. So that means the zero bit, it, we can either have the zero bit set or we can have the negative bit set. So zero or negative. Uh, next one is an unconditional, yeah, unconditional jump, just plain old do do a jump no matter what. So let's just put a um, three input and a gate out there. And then And then we'll call it jump. Simple, simple. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, well, so yeah, I was like, say, well, what's the eighth one? Oh, the eighth one is don't jump. Uh, so if all the J bits are zero, that means don't do a jump no matter what. So of course, we're, we're trying to yield what whether we load the program counter or not. And so if we don't jump, obviously we don't load the program counter. So the eighth one isn't, doesn't have to be represented here. Okay, fine. So now, uh, now it's really simple. All of these have to be word together. If any one of them are true, then it means we jump. So that smells like a multi input or gate then seven, seven input or gate. Somewhere over here. Give me enough room to fan out. Uh, no, not seven data bits, seven inputs. Let's wire this thing in. Let's make him small so we can sneak him in here. And we already have a tunnel for instruction, so let's put the instruction tunnel in 16 bits and going the other way. And I can see I'm going to need some more room, so let's just move the clock up. So we need the zero and the negative flags. So let's create tunnels for those. So I definitely don't want to run wires all over the place. So this will be the zero tunnel. This will be the negative tunnel. Copy those over, flip them around. I wonder if you can flip them around together. Probably not. Oh, of course, not quite enough room yet. And look just like that. We have our program counter load control signal done. That is the hardest one on this whole on this whole design. The increment signal. One more left, and I think we're done. Um, increment signal is actually very easy. Let's talk about it before we do it. Increment. If we're not doing a reset and we're not loading, then we're incrementing. Let's just do a design to keep this clean and simple. So this would be the um, P 
PC uh, increment control. Reset pin. And we need the PC load pin. And then we need an output. Not resetting and not loading. Not resetting. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I remember the AND gate has this uh, nice negation. Let's use it. Nice. AND gate. Uh, we need two inputs. And look, I got a negate. So negate here, negate here. Nice. So not resetting. Not loading. We output. We oh, and we don't want to call that JGT. We want to call it. No, we'll call it nothing. Doesn't doesn't matter, right? So, if not resetting and not loading, then we must be incrementing. Right. So now back to our design. Let me save this. And back to our design. Yeah, let me see if I can back all of these up a little bit. Yeah, so we pull signal off load and we had a pull signal off reset. Make them small. Yeah, so the output of our increment control goes to increment and then so the reset is the top one so we're gonna just oops pull a wire around and we need the result from the load There we are. I believe that implements the hack CPU in Logisim.